Thank you for making the time to join us today. We have a very interesting panel discussion lined up ahead for today's, uh, as part of today's DBWC forums. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all. My name is Nadine Halabi. I'm the Business Development Manager at the Dubai Business Women Council. Um, Today's forum is actually part of uh, one of our initiatives known as the DBWC forums. And usually these forums discuss the challenges that women are facing in different industries. And they also shed the light on the best practices that are in place to tackle such, uh, uh, such obstacles. Today's forum hopefully will motivate women to engage in various economic sectors. Primarily today we're going to be focusing on the construction sector. It's also we aim at accelerating the process of women empowerment in the business community at large and provide female entrepreneurs with knowledge, skills and the tools that they need to enrich their expertise. We have an awesome panel lined up today with us. Um, some trailblazing women in the construction industry who have joined us for today's discussion. And I would like to take a moment to introduce them very quickly to our audience. Uh, Louise Collins, the Head of Engineering and Energy at JLL Nina. Welcome, Louise, and thank you for being with us. We have Cynthia Corby, who is the Construction Leader at Deloitte Middle East and Dr. Reem Sabuni, Associate Professor of Civil Engineering at Abu Dhabi University. Welcome to our lovely panelists. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. And of course, this is all going to be spearheaded by our moderator for today's webinar, Marcus Taylor, who is the CEO at Fifth Edge. Thank you so much, Marcus, for making the time to be with us today. It's also very nice to have a male join us, especially when the topic revolves around diversity and inclusion. Um, <laughs> we have a very, very, very special guest with us today. Before I introduce you to our special guest, I just want to highlight a very important point that the Big Five Women in Construction Awards are coming up. These awards aim to highlight the positive impact a gender balanced workforce has by putting in the spotlight female professionals that excel in their role and companies that have a, that have a proven track record of implementing positive change to push the industry forward in equality and representation. The awards are open to female professionals and companies who operate in the Middle East Africa and South Asia's construction industry. The entry to the award closes on the 6th of July. So make sure you head to the website, which we will put in our chat box very soon and submit your nominations. More information can be found at the website that we will include in the chat box as well as on the DBWC website as well. So now moving forward, I would like to introduce our guest of honor for today. I'm very proud to welcome Her Excellency, Dr. Raja al Gurg, the president of the Dubai Business Women Council to deliver the keynote address. Thank you, Dr. Raja, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. It's my honor to be at this uh, forum. Ladies and gentlemen, although there is only one gentleman, so we will say ladies and a gentleman who had really appreciated our forum. Our distinguished guests and partners, good afternoon. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome you and thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. We are very proud to host this forum in cooperation with the Big Five which puts the spotlight on diversity and inclusion, a very important topic that is receiving more attention among businesses in various sectors in recent years. Diversity and inclusion should not be treated as a one-off initiative. Promoting diversity and inclusion in the workplace is a constant work in progress and it should be maintained and nurtured as a long-term strategy. The aim of today's forum is not only to shed light on existing challenges, 
related to diversity and inclusion in the construction industry, but create a real change and turn words into action. The fact that today's entire forum has been dedicated specifically to the issue of diversity and inclusion in construction is a positive sign that corporate led leaders and key stakeholders in the sector are committed to addressing this matter head on. Recent research from McKinsey found that companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above their respective national industry medians. While laggards in both gender and ethnic diversity are statistically less likely to achieve above average financial returns. By the year 2025, 75% of the global workforce will be made up of millennials. Who will be responsible for making important decisions that affect workplace cultures and people's lives? This group has a unique perspective on diversity, so the outlook is bright. Many of the construction industry's most important players are very aware of diversity benefits. Corporate leaders are increasingly putting more emphasis on uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives, working to attract diversity talent and build the inclusive cultures necessarily necessary to retain them. But as the research shows, the industry weighed down by its long history of non-inclusion still has a particularly long way to go with the talent shortage growing more and more severe. Companies now need to pursue DNI initiatives while with a greater sense of urgency. In order to develop effective solution, a lot of work needs to be done. First, to understand the underlying issues and obstacles in the path to progress. Stereotypes and biases need to be confronted. Flexibility needs to be encouraged. Traditional models of reward nation needs to be challenged and good intention needs to be seen through a tangible exclusion. Evaluation is an important element here as a companies can't put forward plans to promote diversity if they don't know where they stand. This is where data collection, knowledge sharing, analysis, and employee feedback can play a big role. Ladies and gentlemen, home to over 200 nationalities. The UAE is a great example of a country that has promoted diversity and inclusion in all segments of society. The government established a gender balance council that is accountable for developing and implementing gender uh, balance agenda, while women are well represented within the government and business community. Meanwhile, the UAE has adopted progressive policies to empower and integrate people of determination in the workplace and involve youth in shaping the country's future. Within the UAE, there are many players that are encouraging women to actively participate in the economy such as Dubai Business Women Council, which is the leading platform for personal and professional development of business women in the country. Established in 2002 under the umbrella of Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Dubai Business Women Council is the UAE leading platform for the personal and professional development of business women in the Emirate of Dubai. Since its establishment, 
the Council has dedicated its efforts to enhancing gender parity in society and encouraging women to play an active role in building the country and stimulating sustainable development. Dubai Business Women Council's initiatives, programs, and events take a holistic approach to uh, supporting business women as they cover everything from networking and education to business development, entrepreneurship, and innovation. I am fortunate to be joined uh, by industry experts who will be sharing their valuable insights and experiences with us. And I am sure that we all can learn some important lessons from them, which we can take back to our own organizations. I hope you will find the forthcoming discussion to be informative and insightful. I wish you all a wonderful day and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raja. Some very, very insightful, insightful points. I think you've covered a lot of points that we really want to get, uh, get stuck into here. Um, I know time is against us, so we'll, 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 we'll fly straight in if I may, but thank you very much for that, that uh, introduction. Um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Raja, you, you came up with some really good points citing real change. And I think one of the first points we really want to get into in a, in a very gritty way um, is something from my background about trying to bring people into our industry, into the, the, not just the UAE, but the Middle East, and having more choice to bring great talent is, is looking, targeting to the, the young talent, the youth, the millennials, and beyond the, the next generation is called beyond the, the millennials, it's like Generation X or whatever it is. Um, but really, what are the new ideas uh, and were actually things that are actually being put into place to attract that young talent to the construction industry and to come over uh, to not just the UAE, but the entire GCC and take on these big projects? Um, Louise, can I ask you your thoughts on this? Because I know this, uh, this one runs quite deep into yourself and your time with GLL in the back of your career. Yes, absolutely. So I've spent the last... 10 years trying to figure out why there are not more women around me in the office and I went back so far as to let's go into primary secondary and universities and understand why universities like Harriet Watt are only getting 17 percent of women in their engineering courses so we went to um, a primary school uh, just before the pandemic and we asked everyone in the class to draw an engineer and all apart from one drew a man so for me, I think a lot of this is aesthetics and changing perception of what we are and being more vis visible and representational when we're um, expressing ourselves and when we're representing our, our companies. So women knowing that there's other women that can mentor them, that they'll be surrounded by more women in the university and in their jobs. Um, can I can I just ask you? You said there's seventeen percent of, of of women in those in your courses. Can I ask? Do you know by any chance what percentage actually finish the courses? Um, quite a high number. The biggest issue they have is that only twenty five percent of women are go into their relative fields after conclusion of their degrees. Again, for me, that really is being able to encourage them in with with the flexible hours, with mentoring, with leadership courses really kind of supporting each other um, and obviously pipeline is the fundamental issue so getting them into the getting them into the industry retaining them in the industry and then developing them into leadership roles so that they do become representational of of what our industry is do you find do you find this a, a sort of de-feminizing if someone's seen as a as going to the civil engineering or a related to related courses at university oh. Well, I've just come from, I've moved to JLL, which is um, a multidisciplinary company and business strategic company. And I've come from an engineering company where it was very male dominated, very, you come in and you sit down and it's, it's men. So to walk into a company where you have more diversity, you're automatically encouraged in, you feel more comfortable in your environment. Yeah, I, I know from having a daughter, I know my, her Lego sets are generally frozen themed. 
uh, which I think is a fantastic start. Uh, Dr. Reem, can, can I ask for your input in here because you're really at the precipice uh, of, of um, dealing with the, the, the uh, diversity of, of talent and attracting them into uh, tertiary education in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, one of the main, I, I strongly agree with the points that uh, Lucia saw, uh, mentioned because uh, really one of the main things is that when they when they look into, especially when you go into engineering in construction part or in civil engineering, they end up seeing there is less amount of uh, role models or examples that they can go and say, be more comfortable seeing that, okay, I know that there's a female that already had done that, so that will give me uh, like a confidence that I can do it. So um, it, it is one of the main things is having more raw models in uh, shown for females. So when you look at the uh, now when we're looking into universities, it's it's becoming better. Um, some uh, some of the universities are getting a high number of, of, of females in engineering in general. Uh, less of that is in the construction part or in the civil engineering, but having someone that is there for them to show that, okay, I did it before you, uh, these are the obstacles, I was able to overcome them, and putting a perspective of a female into the ideas or the workforce itself or into whatever, like looking at a perspective from a female point of view. So sometimes when they begin discussing their uh, concerns with a male, the answers that they may get were not may not be that uh, making them more confident to come into that because it's more of tailored to what a male would have wanted to have in his career. Whereas if you're looking into having, so the main key point is more uh, female uh, role models in there, especially when you see them in uh, some of the uh, leadership positions. I had the chance to uh, meet with like here in, in the UAE, we have a lot of uh, like in, empowerment for women in, in all sectors. One of them is in, in the civil also engineering. And I was uh, uh, very happy to see that in, uh, we had some chats with Abu Dhabi municipality, let's say, for example, and there was one of the heads of the department was a female. And she was saying that we have about 80% of my staff are females. So when she was ahead over there, so she ended up being able to attract more females into that. And they're working in civil construction, uh, civil areas, so civil engineering uh, areas. The, the civil engineering, in my, in my background, I've always found you know, over the last 15 years of, of, of in this industry, a lot more uh, women are involved in health and safety, in environmental side, et cetera. You should be 80%, I mean, let's get, everybody knows there's an issue here. So Lizzie, what did they actually do to bring that 80%, to change that balance? What action did they do that we can learn from that can actually make that change? Um, I, I believe from, from like what I can believe that one of the things is that first of all, they were able, there was one of the, like the head of the department was a female. So that is a first, first step. Then what they said is like uh, it it is really um, uh, they're working on civil it's not i'm not speaking about the health and safety not uh, so it's really civil works where they go in and inspect uh, infrastructures uh, inspect so I, I believe that first of all the role models then when you end up having uh, someone that can really understand what are the needs of the, of the females without having to uh, jeopardize or be un, like unfair when when you have males versus females so you cannot go and say, okay, yeah, because you're a female, you're not going to do this or you're not going to do that. No, that was one thing that when in the discussion, they emphasized on, I, my female staff go into pipelines, inspect pipelines, uh, they go into uh, uh, projects, they are on the side, they are, but when you end up seeing that, at least when there are some concerns that will not go with a bias uh, restraint or with, with some bias uh, actions, it ends up they feel that, okay, they know that, okay, uh, I will do all the work, all this equally, but I, I need this flexibility in this, in this area. And that's I, not affecting the job uh, perspective. I completely get that. But my, my, my question really goes beyond, beyond that, really, because you know, if you're, going, you're at school, you're finishing school, you're a, a young female professor about to go into your, your next education, you've got all these prospectuses in your hand, you've got an idea of what you're going to do for the next four, five, six, seven years of your life in, 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 in academia. How do you get that individual to go, 
actually civil engineering, that is a good cause for that's a good cause for me. It'll give me a good career and the right path. How do you get them to change their mind at that point in comparison to what they've been doing in, in our legacy issues? I think a lot of companies that have set that have set big KPIs know that they have a KPI that's going to grow. So they're going deeper into pipeline. They're going into universities and setting up um, internships and mentoring programs from the start. Obviously, on the back of that is maternity, flexible hours, etc. Um, so you're giving them a, a better into universities. You see that from their open days, et cetera, they're giving them a better goal to say, you may have come here to look at this particular you know, um, subject, but actually this will give you a secure, balanced, uh, challenging career. Absolutely. And Microsoft did it with quite a few number of universities um, a few years back, and they're reaping their awards for that now with the percentage of women they have on their leadership team and in high tech engineering roles. They've done sponsorships and um, they've mentored, they've gone in right where they need to go in to get people into the pipeline. Well, that's a really good point. If I can just move over the subject just a little bit, I think it's, that's a great initiative for a lot of universities or companies, small and, and large, to be able to address those talents at that point. Um, I'm going to put the, the conversation over to Cynthia, if I may, uh, because this is something I think is, we're now talking about getting them some to change from what they might have looked at with financial or whatever the case may be, business to, to civil engineering at the early to early times. Um, but as advisors and Deloitte being one of the most powerful companies in the, in the world now and moving into that heavy advisory side. So the, what's your thoughts about seeing your people or in the people with uh, alternative non-civil engineering bias degrees, qualifications, moving into construction uh, and making a, a, a certified change. Thank you, Marcus. I think I'm going to come back in my second life as an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm an accountant, a, a chartered accountant, so I've audited uh, many construction companies over the years here in Dubai. Um, but I think, as you, as you mentioned, there's so many other ancillary services besides the core engineering, obviously, which is which is critical and it's lovely to meet both Dr. Reem and Louise um, who, who definitely stand out as one of the few women in the industry. Um, I think focusing on those ancillary services um, that tie into construction is key as well. Um, and if you look at the mega trends that are, are coming in terms of the industry and, and digitization and new construction methods, um, you look at obviously innovation and how that's going to drive change in, in delivering some of these large scale projects. Sustainability, there's so much in terms of these new mega trains that maybe wasn't there a few years ago um, to attract this talent pool. And totally agree with Louise and, and we do exactly the same. You go and we call them milk grounds where you go and see fresh graduates at university and you, you educate them, right? Because I remember when I chose what I was gonna do, I kind of liked the idea, but didn't really know very much about it. Um, and as you get deeper and deeper into, into the, your, your career, you realize, oh, this is actually what it's all about. So I think it's really critical um, to go and meet that talent pool at the universities and even before they choose degrees, um, to go and educate them just how broad the options are in, in terms of the industry. And construction is so critical to most economies. And we've seen that in, in any new policy that new government sets, construction is usually at the heart of it in terms of they're gonna invest in new infrastructure and invest in, in, in construction to stimulate the economy. So I think it's linking it to that much broader picture in terms of what construction and the involvement in their broader ecosystem brings um, to, to a country's economy as well. So I mean, uh, looking at the, I mean, in my experience, looking at the, the big four or so, some ones who have moved into the construction advisory who have <laughs> gone down that slippery slope. Um, a, 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 there's a lot of those ex very, very senior people who have been iconic in the construction industry, have moved to McKinsey or moved to Deloitte or EY, et cetera, uh, and taken kind of head roles in there. Does that not exasperate the problem again by just filling it full of, the usual construction legacy people who are generally male uh, and come from that one-sided uh, background? Well, I kind of resonate with, with Louise's comment in terms of when I first 
uh, started auditing our construction companies. Um, most of the clients that I would go and meet, I was the only woman in the room. Um, today in my team, I would say we're probably 60% women and 40% men. Um, and it, it just resonates again with that, having those role models, right? Um, so that women know that they can succeed and that is something they can aim for. Um, and it is possible. Uh, so it's just, I, I know it sounds cliche, but it is making sure those role models are involved in educating our younger generation on, on the answer possible. Um, and just the broad aspects of what those options are. Um, certainly at Deloitte, I, I remember my CEO saying, introducing me as, as the lead of construction in the Middle East and saying, you know, it's unique that we have a woman leading this, but um, I was fortunate that I demonstrated passion about the industry. I had lots of uh, large clients coming to Dubai at the time of the peak um, and was, uh, was able to really build on that uh, experience and working with some, some truly, you know, iconic clients that have built iconic assets here. Um, so we just need to keep pushing the envelope, I think, um, and, and setting those KPIs that Louise mentioned as well. Can I ask you just, just to drill in a little bit more? Because the, one of the answers I'm really looking for, the idea of looking for, is about transferable skills, uh, whether it's male or female. You know, yes. something like the law is an advisory part, looking away from the finance side, but more change management, stress management, etc. What if someone's in another industry, whether whatever it is, or it's IT, aviation, whatever the heck it is, what can someone like Deloitte? or how what experience you have or what results have you got for bringing someone with another background and successfully bringing them to construction, whether it's the Middle East or not, and then being very successful rather than having the, the old construction background. What positions can have that opportunity, no matter what uh, gender they are? Yeah. I mean, if I think of some of our, um, our partners that sit in our uh, group that we, we call infrastructure and capital projects, um, a number of us have different backgrounds. So, okay, mine is financial, but uh, we have IT partners who, with the, the move and the mega trends to digitize um, construction, um, not only the actual automation and the, and the building process, but the way we look at information and to make it more real time so it informs better decisions when you're on the project. Um, they came with pure IT skills and had to upskill and understand the construction process so they could come up with a solution to give contractors and engineers more real-time information to make critical decisions that would affect the critical path on the project and keep the projects on budget and on time because every day that a project slipped costs millions of dollars. Um, so that's an example of a transferable skill where they looked at other industries and how they used IT to make quicker decisions um, and get real-time information, and then looked at all the different sources of information on a construction project and how they could bring them all to one place to, to enable that, that quicker decision-making, which ultimately saves, saves money on the project. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, Louise, I think Louise has some connection problems. Hopefully she'll be back in a second. Uh, Dr. Reem, I'd just like to ask Louise a uh, question if she's coming back for a second. Nope. Um, Oh, yep, sorry. Yeah, there we are there. Sorry, uh, on one of those transferable skills, and I want to go back to the Dutch room one second, but just before I do that, Louise, in my experience, project management, obviously a key part of it, of, of construction or anything else. But you know, look at IT, we look at um, uh, you know, a lot of virtually a huge amount of, of the different sectors. A good project manager, agile, whatever the case may be, can theoretically move from one environment to another and follow the same methodologies. However, in, in my limited experience in construction, it's a very one-sided part. You cannot have someone coming from an alternative background, maybe slightly, maybe some, 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 some very marginal exceptions. But uh, Things like project management coming into someone like JLL from another background. Have you seen any other parts of supervisory, um, engineering, uh, value engineering, whatever the case is, that you can bring someone from, attract them from another uh, industry that may be distressed or maybe is thriving and bring them over to us? 
Um, very much. Um, we have a retail team, we have a food and beverage team, a hotel team, who all come in from chefs through to um, people who run shops and retail um, lines, and they are coming in, they're, they're consulting on the rollout of big retail schemes across the world. Um, sustainability is one that's become a very transferable now at the moment. It's obviously a very up and coming um, uh, job. So people are retraining to do that very much. The whole net zero is very hot and it's a, it's a new skill for everybody out there. So that's a big reskilling um, opportunity as well. So we have all walks of life in here, particularly project managers. I think if you are if you're educated and you're passionate about what you do, you can apply those skills to most things and retrain for sure. Yeah, a lot of the hardest part there is getting your CV and run in front of the right people and actually having the conversation, which is, uh, in my experience, the hardest thing. Dr. Reem, just taking that point on board and looking at uh, being able to offer your, your students at um, in Abu Dhabi that, albeit you're going to look towards going through a construction bias education, you won't be limited to that. It'll actually open a lot, a lot of maybe bigger projects or bigger ideas and for me I think if I study hospitality and then I was in a situation where I can actually build the next biggest range of hotels in the world it'd be very exciting is that something you feel you're able to promote to your your, your future uh your future students and existing students sorry Dr. Reen you're still at your, your microphone but I was uh, muted sorry yeah, this is something that we try to emphasize on, especially now with going towards the smart cities in, in the future. So it's it's more of everything is merged together so they cannot be just uh, concentrating on the construction industry. So in that, usually we go and uh, providing students with electives uh, that uh, go and uh, widen their perspective. So when they're working on, on uh, aspects that are related to civil engineering, now we go into, okay, sp uh, like let's say if we're going into uh, uh, the roads when we're speaking about that. Now we are looking into how can we implement the IT into the construction of, or the mix when we're having now, we're, we're expecting to have the smart uh, cars and the smart systems. Uh, when you're speaking about the infrastructure for the uh, smart uh, networks, so what we try to do is to widen their perspective in a way that they uh, widen their options. Uh, so it's not only concentrating on whatever is in the construction industry, but what is expected for, for them as skills in the future. And we have a lot of teams uh, that when students go into uh, global competitions, uh, activities, we try to merge between different engineering disciplines which gives them uh, a way of, of uh, communicating with other disciplines from the computers, uh, from the computer engineering, from uh, the uh, uh, mechanical engineering. From, and this gives them on board a lot of extra ideas uh, to, to carry on with them and to put it as a perspective in when they're, when lo they're looking what to do in the future. So it's not, it's the major concentration is on the civil aspects in general, not only the construction, so also. And one thing that is now we're uh, putting a more emphasis on is the sustainability, which is uh, all the environmental aspects of sustainability and uh, power, sustainability, energy, all of that inside the civil curriculum. So when they go out, it's, it's, it gives them a wider perspective of uh, a civil engineering work that they will be going into in the future. Uh, you're muted now. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, thank you very much for that, Dr. Um, Cynthia, if I can bring you uh, back into this, this next topic, if I may. Um, we, we, when we did a little bit of social studies beforehand, and looked at you know, what uh, other industries have done to really change. I know this is maybe overlapping in a few parts, but um the, the 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 armed forces for example um you know they were about 10 to 14 percent of women uh, in the armed forces um and similar to the uh the, the british police force which are now increased their numbers to between 25 and 30 percent depending where in the uk um, uh, so there's some particular historically male dominated professions uh that we've there, there's been some great initiatives over the years to in these countries to really 
bring that into uh, or diversify it. Um, do you know of any particular initiatives that, albeit the police force and the armed forces, <laughs> slightly different, though sometimes in, in, in a 905 it's a bit similar, but any initiatives that, that other people have done that we could maybe adopt from a, a more holistic view? Um, and I'm really, we've talked about a lot of these, like, what really could we all do to actually make that change? Yeah, I mean, over, over the years, um, when I've chaired Women in Finance uh, for ACCA, um, we've looked at obviously the typical reasons why women um, don't remain in the profession. So it's a similar challenge for finance as well. Um, and looked at the trends of where women typically get lost along their, their career journey. Um, and I'm sure it's exactly the same in, in most industries. Um, and it's typically when they tend to start a family that they feel they can't juggle their career uh, as well as family. And we tend to lose this huge talent pool that all companies have invested in. They've come in as fresh graduates. We've spent years training them. Um, and it's about really offering those enhanced policies that allow them to return to work um, even if that's on a part-time basis, so that you don't lose your investment in this huge talent pool. Um, and I know it sounds simple, um, but it's really coming up with policies that work for both the employee and the employer and, not, and having it as a living document. So we might all have policies written, but really having examples of where people have managed to do that um, and, and have that work-life balance with family as well as their career um, being able to continue uh, while they've had family and, and while obviously they're raising young kids as well. Um, and it's coming up with those, like I say, living policies um, that people believe are real that they can actually tap into because otherwise we just lose a huge part of the workforce. I think our work-life balance is extremely, extremely important, especially in yeah. this part of the world where there's a massive expatriate side. Um, I mean, unfortunately, we've, we've lost Louise at the moment. Uh, hopefully, she'll come back and join us because basically, there's some very valuable parts in this. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I've found you know, personally when looking at, I'm going to slip into the a question about the maternity leave here as well, mm -hmm. um, if I may. Um, and having just had uh, my, my, my our, our family increased by one little one, uh, mm -hmm. which makes me a complete majority in my sorry minority in my household. <laughs> And they will not let me forget it. Um, you know, things like technology, etc. Technology moves exceedingly fast. You know, my, mm. my wife works for one of the biggest uh, tech firms in the in the world, for that matter. Um, and in security is where things move day by day by day by day by day. In, in let's look at maternity on, on this one part, and then on to another part. So, how can we ensure that um, a mother or father or maternity or paternity is able to keep up with those only only maybe two or three months or whatever it will be not to extend it but keep on top of the game the whole way mm -hmm. through how can we do that because this when someone comes back they're generally seen as being a, a bit of a dead weight until they get back up to speed again is there something we can do or something Deloitte do to keep people on the uh, that keep them on the, on the pulse well we don't mandate it but it's definitely optional for people to still continue all their learning we have mandated learning every year that everybody has to do um, we would never mandate that people do that during their maternity or paternity period um, or even on their sabbaticals but it's definitely something that the pandemic has allowed us all to do better um, and that is working remotely um, and, and people used to have question marks around is it practical? Are people going to be productive? Is it really going to work? Um, and the pandemic has proved, yes, it can. Um, put the right systems in place and, and everybody can remain in touch. So I think helping create that pathway for people to continue whatever learning they need to do or, or staying in touch with teams, whether they dial in once a month and just stay up to date, um, just understanding what's happening in the organization so they can you know, know exactly what those touch points are and, and how things are changing um, is key to keep them engaged. I think what we've been through recently in the pandemic is a little bit of a kind of false kind of petri dish 
uh, if I can use a horrible <laughs> terminology. I mean, because we've got a lot of pandemic babies, uh, and, you know, myself <laughs> coming on board. But it allows us, you know, maybe to spend that not so much time um, going to work and getting back from work that you normally do, and a bit more time at home with the support uh, system, which maybe allow that individual to do a little bit more training, keep up to speed. Um, do you think that's something that's going to continue as we go forward, just in the overall culture, you know, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic? Um, do you think those trends are going to continue? I think a lot of big businesses, and it's been all over the news, right, in, in terms of people revisiting the way we used to work and, and coming up with a policy of the future of work. Um, so I think we would have lost a significant opportunity if we all just go back to business as usual. Um, we've we've seen how it works, and and coming up with a with a hybrid system is something we're certainly looking at uh, at Deloitte. And there have been some announcements in in various geographies already in terms of giving people options to come in two days a week, um, and and you know you can structure that around your your family and and what your your commitments are for your children, um, or if it suits you to come in five days a week, then you know it's it's just giving people those options, which I think really widens the net um, in, in terms of the, the talent pool. Can I ask you, so one last thing, um, the, albeit you're basically, your, your focus on construction, of course, but I'd imagine you're exposed to a lot of other parts within the, the Deloitte's uh, um, arena of expertise. Do you find those changes that are being put into construction are late to the game? Uh, as far as support for maternity and paternity leave, et cetera, um, is that something that other industries have, have had for quite a while now that we're maybe just, just picking up the adoption of them? Um, specifically in construction, I wouldn't be able to comment. It's not something I've really observed or, or focused on. Um, within Deloitte, obviously, we are all organized in industries, but our overriding policies apply to all of us. So it's not a difference that we would have seen as, a, as an organization because we have the same policies for everybody. But specifically working in construction, um, in a construction company, that's unfortunately not somewhere something I can comment on directly. A work-life balance is not something that's, uh, that's known all that frequently in, in, in construction. <laughs> yes, it's, well, it's, the uh, same in the profession, the same in the profession. It's a constant challenge, right? And the pandemic made us... Uh, available for, for many hours because everything was online. Um, but I think it is about discipline and, and some of the people that ask me how I've managed um, with family and, and a career is, and something I always say to, to anybody who asks me is you've got to set your own boundaries as well. Um, and make sure you obviously deliver what you need to deliver for, for your role. Um, but also let people understand what your boundaries are and when it's family time and when you're available again, maybe after that. Um, and I think that's important that you, you create your own boundaries so that you set your own work-life balance as well. Don't only rely on the organization to do that for you. Dr. Reem, any thoughts on that subject? Yeah, it's, uh, there is a, like when you speak about uh, one thing on top of maternity leave and uh, for, for me, I believe that one of the advantages that came up with uh, this pandemic, with all the disadvantages, one of them is mainly introducing this hybrid type of, of system of work, uh, the, the, the work procedure. So now you end up, and I'm, I strongly believe that it will, uh, like in both the industry and even in the education, I think it will stay somehow. Uh, it is, we uh, have the systems now, uh, the system and the infrastructure available. So I think people will still be uh, trying to work or benefit from that infrastructure that they spend uh, effort on uh, building. Uh, so I think the flexibility uh, and that will attract a lot of talents, that will attract a lot of females. And this is one of the things that young, young uh, people that want to go into the workforce, males or females, especially when they're talented, they look into flexibility, first of all, because they want to be able to juggle between, other, between the family and their uh, uh, travels and and then building skills also because this flexibility gives them more uh, more uh, uh, ways to more time to build skills and challenges also so this will give them uh, an opportunity one point other than maternity that I would like to mention 
a lot of places that attract females is when they have uh, the when they have this something very simple, which is specifically having a daycare on 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 site or close to site or a contract with a with a daycare or a, a nursery that um, accommodates the the children. Because the main concern would be if they're working uh, like uh, face to face is after the maternity, which is the the several months depending on which place. And so it's not usually enough to have the female all concentrating in her work and, and feeling uh, uh, comfortable, but having such types usually encourages a lot of females into that uh, company or into that, um, uh, like, especially if, it's, if, if there's certain contracts and uh, they have subsidies for that. So I think okay. this is something that's very critical in this case. I think that's a, that's a very, very, very good point. Um, and I'm gonna throw a little bit, uh, tip the apple cart a little bit here. Um, you know, coming from an SME background as well, it's one of the different, different, different things I've had to deal with in the past is having looking at two candidates who are very similar skill sets, very similar in culture, fit, etc. One male, one female, um, and how, looking at the risk it's going to be on my uh, team for uh, for for maternity leave. You know, there's very few people in the Middle East as I see it. I know actually that the stay-at-home dads, mostly stay-at-home mums, although I know quite a few, including my brother back home, uh, who've done it for many years. What can we do for an SME, which is a very, very large part of the working population in the Middle East? What can we do, in this at Louise, um, what can we do to balance that, that out and alleviate the risk? Is there anything we can really do to support the, uh, the SMEs and give them the the backing to make the decision to take on the uh, uh, to take on a woman over the man. Well, firstly, on what you said about stay-at-home dads, I think one of the statistics that came up this week for me was um, couples are twice less likely to get divorced if both parents are working and sharing both work and household chores. So there's definitely I need to take some of that advice on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it is the elephant in the room. 96% of women have or will have children. So at some point as an employer, you will have to invest in maternity leave. I think we need to sell it as a return on investment. What are you getting for it? So women are 22% more likely to stay with employers out of loyalty. They're 34% better at compromise. They're 34% more likely to be honest. Um, they're 30% more likely um, to provide fair play and benefits to their employees, and they're 22% more likely to be better mentors. So really, that return on investment on the back of um, what was said in the keynote speech of companies that have a more diverse um, culture are going to be more, are, are inevitably more profitable, and that's based on actual facts. So I think 45% um, compared to 26% on innovation and profit if it's a diverse um, employment or a culture harvest. Excellent, Louise. Well, thank you very much. You're, you're an engineer down to the bone, come in with the hard, the hard numbers. Uh, I'm just going to ask, before um, we, we kind of go to the, the q and I'd just like to ask um, all of you just one particular thing of making an actual action for our viewers and our, uh, our guests there. Um, Cynthia, if you are someone out there, an employer out there, can you give us one particular thing that they can do tomorrow or next week to actually make a difference and attract better talent, more diverse talent without the risk to their company? One particular thing that you would say that would be a great thing to do. We have adopted um, looking at avoiding any bias in selection. Um, of candidates. So really looking at the data and, and looking at the CVs coming through um, and making sure we are avoiding bias in our recruitment process. So I think that's an important lens on the process we all apply and linking that to your diversity KPIs. So we have very strong KPIs in terms of mentoring women and sponsorship of women to, to bring them up to, to leadership positions. And I think it ties in from who you recruit and how you bring them through and making sure that we hit those numbers at the leadership level as well to create those role models. I think it's a very important person you have to put heading up that, that uh, non-biased selection process. Dr. Reem, can I ask your point on that as well? Is there anything you can, we as the viewers, et cetera, especially employers can do tomorrow 
to make an actual change in the problem we have? Uh, to benefit from what we learned from the pandemic here and uh, offer a little bit more flexibility, which will attract more talents, males and females, and uh, try to go out of the uh, older prototype of uh, working hours and instead of the, uh, the going from that into the key performance indicators and, and the deliverables. Uh, form so that will attract more talents into males and females and specifically it will attract more females into into the system and louise you've always been very hard and fast on this what's the one thing we can do tomorrow to make a difference um we have a mentoring scheme at jll where we uh, bring in interns and also mentor females and males in the business but our numbers for our kpis for women are, are much higher to try and balance out that percentage available um, so a big focus on that and just being great role models and representing who we are in a positive way. Fantastic. So Louise gets, gets uh, targeted the, the, the young people coming in with some mentors. Uh, Dr. Reem really making use of our, our COVID advantage here of allowing a, a better work-life balance at home. Uh, and Cynthia really pushing that non-biased selection process as a priority. I think these are all fantastic things we can make a change with. Thank you very much for all your uh, time today. Um, Nadine, do you want to move into the questions and answers if we haven't run over the clock a little bit? Yeah, um, first of all, I want to thank the ladies for the insightful points that they shared. Uh, I completely agree with everything that you're saying. You're voicing out exactly so much of what we're trying to project and what we're trying to bring out to our audience and to our members and partners. And I think this applies not only to the construction industry, it applies to all types of industries. Um, with reference to the Q&A, let's see if we have a question. We have one actually. Um, how does having separate diversity strands address the needs of employees with intersectional identities to foster inclusion? Can you see that again for me, please? I shall. <laughs> How does having separate diversity strands address the needs of employees with intersectional identities to foster inclusion? Does anyone want to answer that question? Because I'm not going to uh, <laughs> push it directly it's to you. the only question we have in the Q&A box. Oh, really? OK. Um, <laughs> Anyone to pick up on that one? Because I, you lost me in the second syllable. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. I think it's somebody has multiple um, professional identities that they want to look at from a diversity perspective, perhaps. <laughs> um, if that's the case, there's lots of companies that have those multiple work streams and that you could probably work across multiple streams in some of the bigger companies, but a lot of the smaller companies are quite diverse in the sectors that they carry out as well. And um, so I would say focus on companies that have the ability to give you that sector exposure. Um, and obviously companies that are willing to obviously support you in, in, as part of their diversity and as part of being a woman. That's my guess of what the question was. I apologize if I got it completely wrong. No, I think I think it seems fine. Any uh, of our other panelists would like to uh, weigh in on that and give their opinion. Okay, I think I think we're fine, Marcus. Uh, there is another question that popped up um, with the statistics that Louise provided regarding women's honestly honesty. How can companies compensate for female CVs versus men's CVs? It's very subjective honesty, isn't it? And you can you can tell how honest a CV is until you meet a person and work with them. I think a lot a lot of that, I'll just jump in that one as well. I mean, coming from a recruitment background and you know, especially on, on, on our new platform, a lot of people say, "Well, how do you authenticate the CV?" You say, "Well, you find out when the person arrives, and you go to a reference track uh, check if they lie in their CV." Well. Uh, yeah, you'll find that really quickly when you interview them asking the right questions. Okay, well, Louise, just going to the honesty part, just um, if I may, one of the concerns I've had, and I've met quite a few people to do this, uh, when I say people, I'm not going to say just the, the women's side, 
And a lot of people do take advantage of employers, especially out here in the Middle East as well. Um, bear in mind the positioning that the, the expats are here. Um, I, I've had a, a quite a few people who have done their maternity, taken their maternity leave, uh, got their, their pay for that, and then decided out to the holidays after that or extend it, and then after extending it, then quit and use that. Uh, now, obviously, there are, there are, there's a very small minority to do that. But that sort of risk, is there, do you think there's something that could, I mean, obviously, there's a reason for that risk, and it's, it is down to maternity leave. Is, is, is that something, is there any way you think we could uh, alleviate that sort of risk, especially for SMEs? No, oh, but I think if somebody's worked with you and they've earned their maternity leave, then they're entitled to that maternity pay. If they're if somebody that's loyal to you, they will come back to you. And if they've decided to go down a different road, then that's quite a personal choice. It's not always ideal, but it could equally happen with a man after going on holidays and asking for unpaid leave. It's not necessarily related to maternity, per se. I see. I would have made, just in my experience, I've had a few people who have done the extended and then decided to go with, and not so much on the financial side, but what it really depends upon is the stress put on by the team uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to compensate on that. I think just to comment on that, Marcus, I know some a, a few years ago, some working mums who had who had gone on maternity were looking at options where they could contract um, two companies and SME specifically, so they could be like a revolving working pool of talent that SMEs could tap into as contractors on a short term basis that gave them work experience when they needed to or wanted to work, and that helped SMEs get the talent that they wanted because there's a huge amount of talent that sits at home untapped as a result. So I think we need to look at some more innovative ways to, to allow this talent pool to engage with business. There's actually, there's actually a, very, a very good website, which I won't name for uh, it's not, not nothing to do with, it with us, but it actually addressed that point. It's very, very successful at putting uh, mums who want to come back into work and with the phenomenal skill sets that you can tap into. I think it's Absolutely. fantastic. Yeah. The UAE is becoming a very flexible place to work now with remote licenses, etc. So I assume this is all to push this forward, hopefully, as well. Even more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was going to say just that, Louise, exactly what the, what the UAE is offering in terms of flexibility is definitely key at this point. I think we've come a long, long way. Personally, I was born and raised here. I've seen this movement. I've seen this change. And for a young country, it's come such a long way. And I feel we are on the right track. But what we need to do in all the industries is we need to keep the dialogue moving and we need to have more inclusion in these dialogues. Like let's take today's webinar, for example. I wish we had more men to attend and join the conversation. Because if you want to talk about inclusion or diversity and inclusion, you'll need to involve the other 50% of, of society. Because we can't do this while we're operating on only one fifty percent of that. And this is what Her Excellency always says. Yes, we are the Dubai Business Women Council. We are there to support business women. But every single activity initiative that we do involves the men if we don't involve them we will not get anywhere so hopefully this could be a great takeaway for everyone please let's have the conversation with everyone with both genders men and women um i think we have one question marcus here the issue with diversity and inclusion goes deep and often goes to the inbuilt prejudices that people have and most probably have grown up. What practical step or steps can we take to change these prejudices? And I think we have two more minutes before we conclude the webinar. Any of our speakers would like to take that question? I can comment on that from, from uh, uh, one case that I, that I, I got at the, we, one of the things is what we're doing now and the inclusion and the dialogue that we're opening and making sure that we include, as, as you mentioned, as much as possible, the males. Because I, we, in a separate event that we did on women in engineering, we had some of the males attending. And at the, end of the sim, at the end of the event, one of them came and sent me a comment saying that I had a twin sister that was planning on going into engineering. I told her not to. He's a civil engineer and his twin sister wanted to be there. And now he said, I, I regret that I, for, I, I, I asked her to go into science instead of engineering. 
because now with the examples that I saw of all of these female engineers that excelled in civil engineering, so that it was more related to civil engineering, he was saying that if I knew that earlier, I wouldn't have went against her. I think everybody's got an unconscious, and there's, there's a study I actually watched a while ago, but uh, everyone's got an unconscious bias, um, whether you like it or not. Um, and, and it's something that I don't think is gonna be easy to, 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 to overcome. I think opening the, uh, opening the doors to everyone into our industry and seeing it as a balanced industry from exactly say the very early, early days uh, is the only way to, to overcome that over the years rather than make a change to overcome it. So I don't think it's gonna be possible. And I think it's leadership awareness as well, isn't it, Marcus? I mean, we just had leadership training on unconscious bias, and it was mandatory for all our partners, senior partners, right through to junior partners, just, just to make you aware of your unconscious bias. And we did some, some practical case studies during the training, and, you know, it was quite telling. Things you don't even think would be there sometimes are there. And it's, it's making sure people are aware of it and check themselves um, so that they don't let it influence the decision. And I think that's the best we can all do. Um, and also just making that business case for different cultures, different backgrounds, different ages, um, and the gender element is what brings that business case together. Because we have to remember, at the end of the day, we're delivering to end users. So it's no point people around the table don't have end user representation. And there's some good examples of women being end users in a lot of cases. And if they're not around the table to know what they're actually going to buy um, or what the younger generation want to see as end users of the future, then we may be not giving them what they want. So it's important to consider that. But I think awareness addresses the question really um, and just making sure we all check ourselves all the time so that we, we deal with that. Thank you, Cynthia. So I think this wraps up the webinar. Marcus, would you like to um, finish off with anything before we thank everyone? Look, from the only, the only male in the room or on the screen, uh, I think it's a uh, fantastic insights. And I think we've set out to accomplish what we set out to do is not just talk about the issues, which every other um, uh, women in construction, et cetera, are, are surrounded webinar event seems to do. I think we've addressed a few things, a number of things we can actually all do in a change. Uh, I think that unconscious bias thing, I think it'd be a great thing for companies to do. I, it, it was entertaining for me to do, and it certainly uh, made me think of a few things that uh, look at myself a little bit differently. Um, but I think that hopefully all our viewers, et cetera, will come up with something positive out here. As a, Again, as a male, I would like to just say one particular thing. Um, Creating a large talent pool of women in our industry should not be a mandatory thing because of a trend uh, for uh, employers to, to, to address. And I've seen this again and again, especially of late, where uh, we're celebrating women in construction, we're celebrating women in engineering, and the companies are promoting the fact that they've got so many women in engineering, so many construction, but it's not that. It's the best person for the job, and it's not a marketing ploy. This is about creating phenomenal talent doesn't matter what creed what gender and this is starting at the beginning like that millennium x as as, um, uh, as our excellency said and starting there and building those up and the stereotypes we have in this webinar today are the perfect start to that so thank you very much for your time agreed agreed thank you so much i want to you know wrap this up by thanking each and every one of you for being here with us today thank you louise thank you dr reem thank you cynthia and thank you so much marcus for moderating the session uh, i'd like to thank everybody who attended today's webinar uh, thank you for joining um, uh, i think today's messages and and discussion was extremely insightful uh, we just have to keep the conversation going and make sure that both men and female are in this together. I want to uh, wish everybody a great day ahead and uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.